um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is, I think, the seventh talk we've done here at Honey's. Um, New Crits is the organization that puts these talks on. New Crits is a global platform for virtual studio mentorship. Um, if you want to know more about New Crits, you can go to our website, newcrits.studio. And um, every month, we are doing talks at Honey's, this bar here. Um, we might be switching that up for the next one, but that's what it's normally been. And tonight, uh, we have the artist Sarah Serpas with us. Uh, I'm going to do a little intro for Sarah, and then um, we're going to get started. So Sarah Serpas was born in 1995 in Los Angeles, California, and lives and works in Paris. Here. And here. <laughs> Yeah. Primarily interested in death and legacy, her work is preoccupied with its own urgency in the face of fossilization. At the present, she's taken to sequestering the mundane. Serpice's work takes the form of unstable assemblages of found objects in which painting, sculpture, drawing, and text bring together personal memories and traces of everyday life. She mashes bits of her life, both real and imagined, into, into anti-portraits some of which she deems fit to share within the context of exhibitions and performances. Precarious assemblages of disparate objects found in the street, which bear the mark of their uses, constitute her most well-known series to date. More recently, she has taken to using photos shot on her iPhone during college as source material for intimate views on unstretched canvas, wood panel, and paper. The unique way she reframes the body in tension in both her sculptural and text-based installations which distort components of our shared architecture, carries into her atypical, atypically cropped portions of stolen archetypical intimacy. It's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody, welcome, Sarah. Hi. Thank you. Really happy to be here. I haven't been to Honey's since like a rooftop party here about six years ago. So, yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was playing Fleetwood Mac for a really long time, and I'm sorry if that was like torture for all of you who have been here for like 20 minutes. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt like it was appropriate, and um, the lyrics to that song are the press release for the show here uh, called Monacos, and I wanted to see if you could just start talking about that. Yeah, so uh, Monakos is uh, Greek for monk or solitary person. And um, I made this show uh, during a period where I essentially had very solitary studio time that was afforded to me by uh, living in a house that had a studio in it. And at the time, um, I had been living in Tbilisi, Georgia, and was painting very slowly um, at a much slower pace than I do now, and was living with these paintings. But uh, I had produced them all and left my apartment for what I thought was going to be a short period. It was in uh, the spring of 2022, uh, and I assumed that I would be back rather quickly. Um, but uh, some medical work kind of got in the way of that that I had to do in Los Angeles where I would be able to get aftercare from my mother, from my family. And I couldn't attend the opening of this show, which was in the summer of uh, 2022. Um, which definitely broke my heart a bit. Uh, it was going to be my second solo show with this gallery. Um, in this show, uh, I decided to draw upon um, sources of painting, like of like material for myself, which had usually been photos that I took myself uh, in college. That had been like a series that like spurred the first like kind of a four dozen or so paintings that I made. Um, because I took a lot of very moody Instagram photos of myself, of people that I was seeing, of people that I was with, of my friends, 
uh, usually in these like pretty cropped, very like tight, think, you know, whatever somebody is down to let you shoot after um, a night out and a morning together. Never really knowing if you're going to see them again or if you're going to see yourself in the same light after. Or uh, photos of yourself that you're willing to post on Instagram or Tumblr or the like. At the time, again, of course, I was taking most of these uh, before I was 18, right after. And they were things that uh, I thought could really resonate with a lot of people. Very, like, moody, like, cigarette, my tights are ripped, and I'm, like, in the bathtub. And why am I in tights in the bathtub? And I'm depressed, and it's kind of gray. Uh, they were things that I was, you know, very willing to share at the time and it was thinking about them as essentially content so what in the mood of these paintings gets at what is like content that I was willing to share probably probably that like kind of spatial imbalance of it being so cropped where you kind of can't make anybody else out but yourself uh this last painting has like a bit of a splatter of it on it I usually use splatters of blood in the majority of like my paintings that have this on them it's usually something that I do after the fact like when I'm nearly done with the painting and like kind of got the 3d rendering of it right in the way that I want it to get to and then I use like these splatters to kind of like abstract it or like kind of remind the viewer that this is like a you know pretty like 2d plane but um in the show I was not able to make it out to to Blisi to be present for this. So the song that I chose, Save Me a Place, was kind of recognizing that I wouldn't be able to make it back to, to Blisi anytime soon. And that I was doing this medical work and starting a residency in another city at the time in Paris and that I was gonna leave my apartment and not really go back for my stuff because I'd taken most of my things. And uh, it, was, it was an all, like be it, sad show and the press release was a QR code that people were, you know, tapping into and then they would be playing the song on their phone as they walked through the gallery. So it also could kind of create a bit of like an orchestra of like this song playing from an already like shoddy recording of this live at concert. So it was probably creating a cacophony at the opening. Can this you piece here. Yeah. Yeah. This is called The Collector. This is a boudoir table that I made out of two disparate pieces of furniture in my apartment at, uh, in Tbilisi at the time that were like in two different sections of the house. So the top and the bottom are not part of each other. The like part that has the mirror has like this shelf section under and uh, the part below that shelf is like a different table. So I make sculpture by like stacking furniture together that like kind of by the end of it looks like it should be together, but it was not meant to be together. Um, so for this, you know, it's just like precariously like leaned on this wall. If you took it off this wall and like somebody bumped into it, that top part would fall. And I uh, put all of uh, my perfume bottles on it and like different effects from the house. Uh, there's like a stone in the bottom uh, left corner from like a trip to Batumi, which is on the Black Sea in Tbilisi from like a nice trip. There's like a lion head that was already in the apartment from... Um, the sculptor that lived in the house before me, that lived in the house during like a, the Soviet period, and he made uh, sculptures out of mostly plaster, and they were left kind of all over the house when I came into it. And uh, these bottles of perfume, the rose, etc. And I called this piece the collector uh, because I was collecting perfumes at the time and all these effects. Um, yeah. I want to go back to the paintings for a second because you were talking about how you're basically uh, you're getting to a point of rendering that you're happy with, yeah. and um, your paintings are really, really strange to me for like so many different reasons. And I, I hope this doesn't even come off the wrong way, but it's like a lot of them are painted in a way that's like it's like the way. It's almost like the way that people paint before they have any painting classes. Yes, like, because yeah, I um, in college uh, I I spent the last two semesters of um, college here in New York uh, learning how to uh, make 
or I was taking classes in sculpture and mixed media collage and performance, um, painting. I couldn't even get through uh, the like color chart, really. <laughs> uh, so um, it was always something that kind of uh, stuck with me as something to improve on, which has happen slowly but I definitely like I'm not able to do underpainting I'm not like a trained in like how to kind of build up a form in like an analytic way like I definitely like I'm not a draftsman at all but um, it I mean it I feel like in the beginning when I first started seeing these I was like I don't know what the fuck is going on and then I kept seeing it and I kept seeing a particular there was just such a deep intentionality about like what you were putting forward as a kind of a proposition of painting that all of a sudden I was like, okay, I have to wrestle with my discomfort. Like in the same way that I think for a long time I really didn't like Rousseau's paintings because there's something both living and dead about them. Like it's just like someone who's jumping, but the way they're jumping, it's like they're a marionette. And there's something, I mean, your paintings also look kind of living and dead. And the rendering is like, flat but then they're so visceral sometimes that let me see if uh in this show no we'll get to the meat of the show in a bit but like there are some really crazy moments that like there's a there's a really beautiful finesse here there's really like there's some passages and moments that feel just, yeah, just visceral, like almost like feral. Yes, uh, that's probably because of how I make them. Uh, so, and by that I mean, um, if you come into my studio, really, oh, really, and you'll be able to see this on the, in the lobby gallery of the Whitney very soon because I brought my, the floor of my studio into that gallery for the biennial. Um, there is just fucking paint everywhere. I must have wasted like so much because what happens with these is I usually, um, so because I don't under do underpainting, I usually, I build up what I'm able to see, again, like on iPhone pictures, and like I zoom in and I do my best. But essentially it's all the same plane, right? So when it's all the same plane and you're not doing different tricks on like one side of like the body in the center than you are doing for the background, then another way to kind of create a difference in the frame is by literally um, I do, uh, if it's on, if it's on fat, if it's like on canvas and I'll get it on the floor and then I'll, if like, let's say there's like a lot of paint on a piece of like jute canvas, if it's to the point where like, I can't make any, like, I can't add anything to it without just like making it gray, which is definitely what ha was happening to like a, a bunch of the, the few ones that, you know, you probably saw when I was first making painting. I'll get it on the floor and I'll put a clean piece of canvas on top of it. And then I'll use like a wood board to literally squeegee the excess paint from the top of the other one and get a perfect imprint of it probably off. But I also just like unloaded about maybe like a pound of paint off of like a pretty large one. And then I could finally go in and actually add color into what I've been doing and kind of try again. So it's like multiple attempts on the same piece that then get ripped out into uh, depending on the size of the canvas, like let's say I have one that's like three by four and then I put it on one that's like uh, two by three, then there's essentially a one to one in like one corner of this canvas that I just used, but then there's also all this like kind of other range that's pretty empty and that I could also kind of continue to act on. Or it's like a bit of like, you know, like that AI rendering of like what happens like at the edge of this frame if like you fill it out. But um, I do that because I don't know how to paint. Um, but I do know how to like wrestle things into usually submission, but usually like how uh, to get to a point where like I can actually make like an impact on the canvas again without like you know wasting a tube of paint. But I never see it as wasting because even like when I make that, for example, this painting, I made an image and then. It, there was too much going on and I covered it in like a sheet and I did like a process like kind of like I used like a block of wood that I had in the studio that was in the show and then I shipped it to New York and then I ripped it off in the gallery and 
that created a pretty one-to-one -one thing that I was very happy with. But those marks and all the marks that were made were by me. It was just me with like a piece of wood that made that ended up making all these like kind of imprints on it that look really like you know like you flashed a photo on like some kind of like you know like something that wasn't supposed to be there. Definitely not in this plane. So it is. It's a Vanessa of like. <laughs> uh, of, um, you know, figuring out how to do things in process and, you know, why my, why my knees look so, you know, bruised up, I guess. I mean, I have knee pads, so, <laughs> but it is like, you know, uh, yeah. I'm but that's like one way. That's like how this one was made. But. I mean, this one, it looks like an x-ray. Like it looks like yeah. what the painting behind another painting yeah. that like somebody excavated. And like a lot of them, at least in this show, have that feel. But so yeah, if you go up, these are like my knee prints on this. That's like me oh. like on top of the wood board with like another canvas on top of it, literally like squeegeeing, squeegeeing, but all of these things, somebody was like, those are thumb prints. And I was like, no, that's like my knees. <laughs> Who uh, thumbs that big? <laughs> well, I guess from afar, people were like, yeah. I mean, there's something about, like, I think this is a through line in all of your work, though, that there's such a level of confidence to the decisions that you make. Like, you, something happens, and you have the confidence. I guess I'm pretty confident them. about things when I'm on top of them. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Say oh. your piece. Mm. Yeah, this is also... Yeah. And then, I guess this one sticks out, though, mm -hmm. to me, in terms of, like, if you can talk a little bit more about process and then also maybe give some insight in how these images were created or like what the gestation Oh yeah, is. okay. So um, so in the last show that we show that we saw, Monacos, um, those images were partially images from college, but then also images that I pulled from again uh, the medical work that I was doing in LA was like uh, revising an older plastic surgery and getting a new one. Uh, so I submitted like images of myself to like kind of forums for like, ad like advice on any potential revisions. But then I also use anonymized images from some of these forums, including Real Self, a few other like plastic surgeons page, uh, pages that again, are like positioned in a way, usually with like a black or blue backdrop that allows for like the angles of like what was achieved during those procedures to be like most visible. But what those end up looking like, those images, like they look like, you know, classical sculpture already. Mm -hmm. They like in the positions and like the ways that things are um, made to stretch out and show like the poor for and afters of like uh, the like muscular and the, yeah. Yeah, the muscles like under the skin uh, that, yeah, I gathered material from that. So in this new show, I used crayon to create about like 10 new images of reclining nudes, of close-ups on bodies that I had worked with in the past. So I was just describing things that I had already like photographed myself that I just didn't have new images of. And what the programs would produce would be, you know, uh, impossibly contortioned bodies and like multiple limbs coming out of, you know, one kind of section of things. And uh, did that continue? Like, is this the only show that you used kind of AI to yeah. develop those bodies? Yeah, so far. Uh -huh. um, recently, I have painted a few more. Uh -huh. Yeah, but they haven't been shown. I want to pivot for a second. Um, in some ways, staying close to the theme of that first show, which is like say the place, because in your installation at the Hammer Museum yeah. for Made in LA, you also couldn't be there, but for very different reasons. Yeah, I'd like to read that one actually. Yeah. So uh, for Made in LA, I was. Um, and during the installation period, the show had been pushed back a year. Um, I was supposed to go and produce a sculpture installation in the lobby gallery because, uh, you know, when you work with <laughs> when you work with uh, uh, things that like have mold and are you know totally you know 
water damage, everything. They tend to put you as far away from the real art as possible. But luckily for me, that means usually the most accessible, like most seen gallery in the entire institution. So that that's happened. A, that's a nice way to think about it. Both at the Hammer and uh, at the Whitney soon. Uh, <laughs> um, so for this show, I yeah, I was supposed to travel and make this work. Made in LA is focused on, while well, the Whitney's focused on American artists, the Hammers focus on artists that are from or are based in LA. I am from LA, but I was living in Switzerland at the time. And um, I, yeah, uh, basically at the time of the installation, I could not travel from Switzerland to LA without having to stick in LA for longer than I could because I was in a, an, I was in a art like uh, MA there at Head in Geneva. So I had the museum put together essentially, uh, yeah, this installation that I can kind of read here. It was also, I mean, just to add, it was during the lockdown. Oh yeah, it was during the lockdown. I couldn't, I couldn't travel. Yeah. Uh, it was during the lockdown. The museum was gonna open on specific hours. Um, so I had other people basically collect this piece. So, uh, Sericerpus, oh yeah, potential indefinite performance, this, that, and now again. Sarah Serpis is from Los Angeles. She was asked to contribute work from the assisted ready-made portion of her practice to Made in LA 2020. Within the assisted ready-made portion of her practice, she tends to source objects from the area immediately surrounding an exhibition site, gather them at the exhibition site, and produce a work or works at the exhibition site or on site. This portion of her practice is dependent upon her unfettered access to the areas immediately surrounding the exhibition site and the exhibition site itself. In the case of Made in LA 2020, the Hammer Museum in Westwood and the Huntington in San Marino, and requires unconditional discretion on her part in the selection of materials as well as the presentation of the work. Due to her residence in Switzerland and the travel restrictions in place at the time of her allotted installation period and the existing guidelines that she received concerning the authorized qualities of materials for exhibition in the institutions, she was not able to contribute work from this portion of her practice to either site of Made in LA 2020. The objects presented here were collected in the areas surrounding this exhibition site and laid out in a grid in September 2020. Collectively, they are not a work or works. They were not collected or laid out by the artist. They were not collected or laid out on direct instruction from the artist. Because the qualities of the objects were subjected to institutional guidelines instead of the artist's discretion, their selection cannot be apportioned to the artist's practice. Rather, these objects constitute the potential for a work or works, a performance set at an indefinite time. These objects will be properly disposed of at the end of Made in LA 2020. Um, so basically, about two months before the show opened, I received a list of materials that could not be included in this installation, which included objects with mold, objects with rain damage, objects that appeared to have any frass or dirt, uh, so, essentially, I mean, I didn't totally, you know, go after the, the curators, but I was invited, like, half a year, uh, about a bit more than half a year before, and if I had showed up and had these guidelines given to me, like, a month before to install the work, I would have had to drop out of the biennial. Um, but because I wasn't informed about that, and I was away, this was an answer to participating that would not, like, kind of jeopardize what I see as the practice, which is kind of, you know, pretty unfettered access to being able to put what I want in a space. Um, and it's not like this is the first time that you've done that. Like it's No, it, it was more like, okay, like admittedly, you know, curating a large show like this. I mean, I, I at the time I was a lot more mad about it than I at, all am now because what ended up happening is a nice like kind of defining for me of what the practice was and I'm more happy with like the text that resulted but the work in the show was the text not the objects right so these you know objects are uh, you know they're nice <laughs> would I have collected them I mean I would have collected some things that they would have been like there's no way you know and then I would have been then I would have been upset then I would have been like what are you talking about like I mean you know obviously there's shit that I compromise on for example, there was a lot of bird shit on some things that I found right now for the Whitney, and they were like, there's no way, and I was like, wrap them up 
And then they had a sign on them that was like, a bird, bird poop serpus takeaway. And I was like, we have to keep this thing. This is like my like Laura Palmer, like wrapped up, like <laughs> thing that I just want to put on the corner of the show. And I didn't end up using it. Um, but, uh, I, you know, sometimes it's like charming to have somebody care that much about you and your work. But, you know, it was, yeah. But this I mean, more so the museum, I guess. But. It's funny to see something that looks like an exhibition that is not the work. <laughs> Yeah. And it, it, then you realize how many things that are not really exhibitions look like the work. <laughs> but that is also a salt drag, I guess. Uh, but uh, this was definitely not the work. But the text could have been the work. I love the, the text, but I had to, yeah. This is, these are selections that you the, did make. These are, these are works. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, <laughs> I'm not staying very linear here. Um, but the the first show, the one thing about Monaco's that uh, I found really interesting, I looked up the word because I obviously I didn't know what it meant. Um, and aside from being like sort of figuring solitude or, or meaning that, it it's taken from the Gospel of Saint Thomas, yeah, which is like an apocryphal gospel. And it was really important to me uh, because my my parents are from South India and they're Christian because of St. Thomas, because he preached the good word in South India. Um, and we know him as Doubting Thomas. We know him for all these other things. But that, that particular gospel is really fascinating. And that word is one of the only un, like words that kind of goes through it that stays Greek. And when I looked it up, it was the uniting it's when two become one. Mm -hmm. And that, I just, I thought like, in thinking about a lot of the things that you do in terms of your practice, like taking paintings and like smushing them together and kind of making one out of them and using a song title for, uh, using a song for a title, using, uh, talking about sculpture as words, talking about poetry as sculpture. There's like all these kind of, things that coalesce and it was just really fascinating to me that this became like my way into your work and like mm -hmm. uh, one I guess I was just curious like is that do you think about that two becoming one do you think about like how you marry contradictions in your work yeah and I could explain where that happened uh, so in like my last three semesters in college I, I was um, majoring in urban studies uh, and by like the end of my junior year I was like I can't be in the libraries here anymore like I'm gonna lose my mind so I switched uh, like I added a visual arts major to it and what happened there is that I had a lot to complete in about three semesters so I ended up having to do essentially five studio classes a semester which how they were running at that school is essentially each class is a day and I was living in Bushwick, so I would have to travel uptown to Columbia to do like a six hour class, like five days a week. So I was really kind of committed, but I also like, I finally had a studio because I switched into the major. And um, so my, so the five classes, I would have sculpture, mixed media collage, painting, uh, performance, and like, uh, like, I don't know, like another class in there. And I would do that like for each semester. So essentially my professors wouldn't really, you know, realize that I was turning in classes from my mixed media collage class in the painting class and that I was using props from painting in my performance class and that I was using things from my sculpture class to like platform like paintings that I was showing and I just learned how to work like that and like save a lot of time uh, by just mixing media in that way, literally to meet deadlines. Um, and I think that gave me some kind of leeway and just not being too precious about like whatever it was that I was doing. Huh. Um, but it was like learning how to work in a rush as well. 
Um, and is that kind of what started the practice of like gathering things? Yeah, because at that point, then uh, it was also from uh, at the time I was working as a stylist, making collections in the city. They were stylists. They were people that had a lot of like excess stuff, and that's not in these images because I've never uh, made a show of them. But uh, I started making work basically like kind of smaller like fabric collages so that would sometimes include furniture objects. But because of that, I learned how to work with other people's things like pretty quickly, and usually like put like a lot of value in either running into things or getting things gifted essentially to me. Um, so I would say, yeah, yeah, that like kind of process brought it into kind of this focus. That, um, yeah. But it feels like like everything that you do use always feels kind of ruined. Like used yeah. for sure, but like it feels more ruined, and it's it's like a funny distinction. I feel like a lot of people are like obsessed with ruins, but yours is like more like psychologically ruined. Like something bad happened to that person. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if these things would be on the street otherwise. Uh, but yeah, the first uh, for an, the first show that I did that included uh, furniture in Miami, um, all of the objects were from a house that had been foreclosed on, on South Beach. Uh, so uh, I had essentially made a very terrible painting show at my friend's gallery, and it was going to be my first solo show. And what he wanted is me to make basically a lot of smaller fabric collages, because that's what I was making. Uh, that was at Current Projects. Um, and he... Uh, was like, you cannot show these paintings. Why don't you just go to a thrift store and make some furniture collages? I mean, some fabric collages. And I was like, that's not the practice. The practice <laughs> is like, people are going to gift fabric to me, and that's how I make the work. But at that point, I had used a lot of it. I had like been in a few group shows. I basically used the majority of all this fabric that I had. Um, so I showed up to Miami and made paintings, he was freaked out, and he was like, well, there's this house down the street for me. I know sometimes you work with furniture. Maybe you could find some stuff that you want to put fabric on. And I was like, okay, let's go look at it. And it was actually just a pile of stuff from probably like the den in this house that had been foreclosed on in Miami. And I was like, okay, let's put it all into a U-Haul and like put it in the gallery. Um, so yeah, in like about overnight, I made a few assemblages. Um, tossed out the other of work. tossed out like furniture from this house and you just got rid of the other paintings that you had already made no 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 they were they were kept and sold later like I thought they were terrible they were they look a lot like my drawings which are on the wall back there that they're it's not really a clear photo yeah, of I don't but, know if there's a good one yeah but uh yeah I want to read this quote that I think I mean this is this is you talking um, that I think informs some of this practice, and I'm, I'm curious like how you think about it now. Um, my mom worked in the property division of the Los Angeles Police Department. Every day she was archiving and indexing the material residue of crime and imparting meaning on the objects through their dispossession. These items were owned by the government and made to say what officers of the state wanted them to in a court of law. My mom knew that belongings could tell on you, so she made me throw away all my shit. We shared a room until I was 17, and I never had any stuff, any clutter. I kept a box of trash under my bed. If it was anywhere else, it would be thrown out. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, obviously there's some Freudian level to this. <laughs> uh, I would say that, yeah, my mom would bring me in sometimes to the property uh, department at the LAPD, and I would see, like bricks of drugs, guns, uh, something that was used to harm someone else. And she did this on the daily. She actually injured her back in this uh, scenario by just like, she was always doing too much, I guess in the same way that I'm always doing too much and just like lifted the wrong thing and et cetera, or in the wrong way. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely, I didn't have any of my own uh, personal space basically until I left to college and then at that point then I also uh, was sharing like a room and I really she was super OCD and I guess I 
kind of ended up rebelling, <laughs> collecting all this garbage everywhere. <laughs> but um, I get, I do get really attached to some things. I've never really had the space to actually like collect. So on this invitation in Miami, I was like, oh wow, I like have all of this stuff um, that I can, you know, like act out kind of any scenario on in terms of, you know, lifting and shoving and like kind of creating these tension exercises that sometimes look like they're gonna fall apart, sometimes looks like looked like things gave up. Um, but yeah, I would say, I mean, it's definitely informed by this like kind of home life relationship to, to space and not really, yeah. As soon as I did get a room, like in my last year of uh, school, I did kind of create a lot of collages on my walls everywhere of this stuff that I had saved like in a box, like under my bed. I had like a bunk bed with my mom until I left for college basically, till like the last year. But I, I was always kind of collecting in this way where like, oh, I'll get to put it up at some point. But um, there's this funny dichotomy in what you say in it too, because when you're talking about the state, like the state is making the object say something. Yeah. And then your mom not wanting you to have any things because they tell on you. Yeah. And like those are two different realms of like how an object speaks. Like one is like you're pantomiming the object and the other is like, well shit, it's gonna it's gonna say what it's gonna say. Yeah. And then your relationship to all of that, which is like trash under your bed. Yeah. And that's just it's like that I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to unpack that. <laughs> I mean <laughs> it was like, yeah, my memories under the bed were like at like uh they could have been like tossed out at any time if they were like out of that box. Well, because sure. it, you didn't you didn't describe it as like precious things. Like you didn't describe it as like I kept the things that I wanted that were like not okay. Yeah. You call them trash. And I think maybe trash is trash is precious to you. Well, yeah, I mean, but when it's other people's, I could like, you know, um definitely project whatever I want on it. Um, but then, you know, when I started painting my photos from college, I was like, this is my trash. <laughs> you know, this is like my like kind of like wasted content that could have been. Um, but uh, other people's stuff somehow, it's not that it's like more precious to me, but I definitely treat it with like more high esteem than I do when I'm just like kind of like, you know, getting a photo that I took that I'm doing like kind of at any cost on canvas because that is also something that I've learned how to kind of mistreat to like get to a point where it feels like, you know, like an x-ray. Um, I can't get x-rays out of the garbage that I collect that I get attached to. I can get to a point that like valorizes what it is and makes it look like, you know, however many like bucks it needs to look like to like be protected by a museum or a gallery. I guess maybe, I'm now I'm like, I also never show paintings by themselves. I, in that case, I did an installation, but I'm, I'm learning, I'm like still getting like some comfort around like showing them on their own. Also with the sculptures, I usually show them in a large kind of grouping. Um, usually because with the sculptures, I title them after lines of poetry. And when you like go through and read the press release and you're kind of reading one big poem that I wrote when I collected all the garbage, all of the photo, I mean, all of the paintings are untitled and will stay that way most likely. These are? These are uh, drawings that I made um, in Tbilisi. Uh, they are language exercises. Um, they essentially start out as like kind of one kind of collage, like wet on wet um, thing on a wall and then I write them while they're still wet. Um, so I do write poetry, usually like on my iPhone, um, like on my notes app so that I could save it. And it's like timed everything. Uh, so these are uh, lines of poetry that I write while they're wet on wet and they like melt while I write them so that I don't remember them and I can't um, use them to like, publish any poetry with, so that I forget them. They're like exercises, so that I can't, like, I mean, I'm monetizing the actual, like, images that come out of them, yeah. but I forget what 
I wrote because it's not like if I don't record myself and I don't take a photo of what I wrote, then they just kind of melt away. Do you, um, do you second guess yourself at all? <laughs> uh, you know, um, I, I, I trust like my taste level. That's amazing. Yeah. I think it's like the thing that strikes me the hardest where I'm like, this person knows exactly what the fuck they want to put out into the world. And it's, I, I have to fight so many demons to like get something out of the studio, but everything here feels so effortless. And there's so many moments when I see it and I'm like, oh, you can do that. Like it's, I think the reason why I really love your work is that it, especially there's so many students here tonight, um, you give permission to do anything. And it doesn't mean that it's like not considered or thoughtful or really like uh, sharp, well. but it's, it's a, it's a level of like not giving a fuck that you really ra rarely see. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say that uh, with this, I mean, getting yourself into the mindset to do these things, depending on like your aptitudes for like how you get yourself ready. I mean, I don't know, like abusing caffeine isn't fun, abusing like the come down from it and like kind of getting into the zone where like you could just get back to work the next day and like, I don't know, I definitely, for some of these, I'm like, I look at them and I'm like, wow, I was not taking care of myself at the time, really. I was just like going to the studio, doing this process that I would like try and get to a point. I was definitely like getting into like emotional states for these in a way that like only, you know, caffeine and then like drinking the night after to like go to sleep could like achieve. And then it would be, you know, classic, like artists, like vicious cycle that like I'm getting out of now. But I'm happy with what was produced from it. But it was definitely that confidence, you know, it's something is that could be. Only vice, like it's not. Right. It's not. It's not my only vice. It's the only thing I do in the studio to like be able to, you know, work for a few hours and feel like confident about what I produced. Yeah. But um, I, the production level, you know, for better or worse, um, you know, is something to be managed. And also, if you know, I want, uh, I feel like. I just moved back to New York over the summer. Like, I have a studio that I want to keep. I have an apartment that I want to keep. Moving so much and making all this work in these different places where I was like, I'm going to be here for a bit, you know, also was a bit of a, there's different ways to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it is, it's interesting to hear, like, if you have rituals around studio practice. I, I'm just keeping this up because this is one of my favorite paintings of yours. I think it's, like, fantastic. This was finished by, like, me, like, kind of, uh, slapping like a wet rag all over this thing, like wet with like linseed oil, like really just like kind of like high school locker room, like <laughs> like towards like the bloody part that I put in the middle. It's like, yeah. I think it's the, the space of it feeling intimate because of its like, because of its unskilled, like unskilled in, in yeah. quotes. Um, like depiction of the body. So there's there's something that feels like really, that something's on display that almost shouldn't be. And nevertheless, there's something really anonymous about it. There's like a lot of different tensions in it. Like as soon as you get a remove where it's like, well, it's a little grayed out and it's pushed back. Then it's like, it's there's this violent like gesture yeah. on it that gets you back in. Yeah. And it. But you see, I didn't let you get close to it because of that wall. You Yeah, you have ways of, keeping people in and out. Yeah. I I do all my exhibition design uh, except for at the hammer, but I I have ways of keeping people away from things. <laughs> um, I'm all about like, you know, uh, definitely people's experiences, but you know, usually it's also like I'm, you know, hiding my own I wouldn't say mistakes, but um, I would say like moments that like I just like, I am like, this is the best view of this. So I'm going to make you have it uh, one way or another. Um, yeah. So, OK, these images. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of people had uh, various ideas about how the sculpture was made. Um, and uh, for this show at the Swiss Institute, I decided, and for a book that I published with uh, Rafik Grice and Dora Boudor for Distance out of Berlin, I decided that um, 
a great thing to do would be to kind of create uh, the scenario of like an editorial uh, with like me as uh, like basically Samara from The Ring, uh, making these sculptures all around uh, Paris. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I decided to, I mean, my, I invited my friend Rafiq to come and basically photograph like me finding objects and like toying with them um, on the streets of Paris in various studios, including my own and in the woods in Fontainebleau. Uh, I would position myself basically by, uh, like my paintings, um, anonymizing my anonymizing me with like, I guess like at the time, like definitely one of the biggest like markers of who I was, which was like this really long black hair uh, and like basically hiding myself in the majority of these photos and like hiding my like production in these. This was a piece that was like completely cut in half. Uh, let me see, there's another one, but yeah, this is like more like in the woods, but I decided to kind of make a bit of a, of a cryptid of myself while also like, you know, staying true to my number one, which is Samara from The Ring. Um, I also screened uh, The Ring for part of this uh, exhibition. Um, but for me, it was like important to kind of like, okay, like if there's a story about this and like this process, then I might as well monumentalize it as like one of like kind of this like kind of wandering, like the scariest part of Samara is that she doesn't show you her face when she approaches you and she doesn't show her hand in like the doing of like people just like turn up dead in this movie <laughs> um, until the end when she does kind of show herself. But um, I thought it was a funny way to kind of talk about this practice, which, you know, um, people have described a number of ways, you know, this is stuff from a house in foreclosure. So this is about the foreclosure market in Miami. This is obviously about the trans body. This is obviously about uh, when I did a show in Naples, what was that about? <laughs> that was about something to somebody. But really, they are performance remnants, and they are things that I am lucky enough to, you know, be invited to consistently put on. Um, and when I have time to myself in a room, like, I can go after things in the way... I, I was a wrestler in high school, so usually, like, I'm actually just on top of these things. I'm, like, kind of, like getting them to a point where like they could collapse but they don't because I've jetted them in the right way into another thing and like they hold because like I held them and I don't know I guess that's like intimate with them but like uh otherwise but also you know like I pulled a muscle last week like kind of collecting these things the collection is also like a huge part of them uh this process was like really fun um but now you know I'm gonna do like physical therapy on Thursday and like learn how to lift because I, I mean, I did wrestling, I kind of know how to lift, but I want to learn how to lift now and be able to keep doing this until, you know, I'm in my 60s, you know. Um, then what? Then, uh, I don't know, I'll just start like kicking things over, I guess. I wanted to, so there's two things that come out of how you were talking about the way that these sculptures come together and then also like, the ring and your relationship to horror. So this is uh, a little quote from a friend of mine. He has a, a sub stack called Spigot, um, the writer Dominic Camarati. He, this, this is something that felt relevant. I was just mm -hmm. curious. Um, in contemporary art, the, the fabulous genre of choice is science fiction. It looks to the future, unlike horror, which dwells on the past. Even a story about dystopia implies we can move forward. Horror suggests we can't. Science fiction is escape. Horror is reckoning. While of course the genre can be turned inside out and in any number of directions, science fiction essentially embraces the rational. Horror is by contrast a siren song of unreason. Ultimately, art's relatively small customer base, rich people and institutions are disinclined to look at, think about, or purchase things that are revolting. Mm -hmm. And I just, like, when it comes to horror and thinking about unreason or just the space of how, like, yeah, science fiction gives you the possibility of hope and horror is just, like, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, I would say that in shows that I've put on recently, the show, again, very inspired by Samara, I put on a show in Paris that was loosely 
both because of this collaboration with um, this musician, uh, one of my favorite musicians, uh, the the caretaker who is whose entire persona is based on the on Jack Nicholson's character from The Shining, and then my own interest in um, this film by uh, starring Nicole Kidman and others, uh, where there's like this house in uh, like total. Oh yeah, here these images are very yellow. Uh, I have. Is it not this yellow? It's not this yellow. Okay. This was made like, yeah, the the photog. It was <laughs> it was a decision to make it this yellow. Um, it's not this yellow. Um, but in both of these instances, I was attaching a narrative to how I was like portraying the show and like the actions in the show and in this one the others uh show it was called i fear because my other title was too long for the french audience apparently <laughs> uh it was a set of the museum um in the show i fear i collaborated with uh five performers to stage uh two parties in the basement of the museum uh that would include these objects being like repositioned in like a few different ways over the course of like an hour long DJ set that I put on where they would essentially be performed to and the audience like kind of acted as uh, people that like were they were behind me while I was DJing to the objects and then being made so that they would have this like kind of position as uh, essentially people that have access to the DJ during a night out at a club. And then they were brought up here in between these two performances to also be me, made by me and five other performers, which is why these sculptures don't really look like the other sculptures that I've made and they have these sheets on them, to essentially uh, have these like frozen states of both like the like people like that stay in the ballroom from The Shining, but then also these like covered pieces of furniture uh, from the movie, the others that are kept that way. Um, to basically protect from dust. But the thing that I like to say about this installation is like in a situation where anything I bring into a museum gets fumigated, then one answer to that would be me casting anything that I make in bronze and then kind of stacking it and then, then it's like safe. But another thing that could get to the form of whatever objects I'm presenting in a museum context would be, well, if you just toss a sheet on them, then they kind of show what the, what's happening under them to an extent, and then it also makes them these ghosts, and it was just like kind of a double, double, double entendre of a show. And then at the end of this, like a week after the show closed, there was a second party in the basement, and we smashed all these objects on stage, uh, oh, wow. and like totally, yeah, destroyed everything that was here. Um, and yeah, so in terms of the horror question, presenting myself as this like, character, this like kind of cryptid in the show at the Swiss Institute in these photos was kind of like creating kind of like this final end for anything that I did because like the objects weren't present. It was like the photos and these paintings and then this kind of collapsed wall that also had a photo on it. And then here it's these objects that were, you know, like there was a party for them. There was like this kind of group possession in here and then they were smashed and thrown out at the end, which has happened a few times. Like the first few shows that I did were totally thrown out and I don't know, I might throw out the objects uh, that will be on view soon here in town. Um, but I'm sure your yeah. gallery just loves that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's see. Um, so there's the other, what I was thinking about in terms of horror is also like humor and the artist duo officially in Vice comes to mind just because of their like precarious assemblages and photos and like I don't know there I think there's like some kind of weird correlate between what they've done and what you're doing but the tenor of your work is really different like theirs is like kind of funny pseudo funny yeah, yeah, yeah. like it's not like laugh out loud funny but like it's in contrast I think there's like moments of like bleak humor in your work but. I wouldn't call it like funny, and I just wondered, like, do you have any kind of relationship with with that body of work? Um. Uh, so, 
Yeah, I would say that um, <clears throat> I know Peter. Okay. Um, and I would say, yeah, yeah, I really, I really like the work. And uh, what is that piece? How things go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way the way things go. The way things yeah. go. I mean, yeah, that's definitely something I saw early on and thought was great. Um, like in in college, but yeah, and actually, Peter has has an installation in this room right now at the Boris. <laughs> oh, really? And he came and yeah. That's amazing. That's yeah. that's so fitting. Yeah. I want to just like I have a couple of like faster questions okay. that we can end with and then kind of open it up to the audience. Um, do you have any favorite teachers? <clears throat> uh, Lily Renard Dwyer. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, in Geneva. And Vaginal Davis also in Geneva. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what is art for? Art is for... Huh. When uh, when I a last roommate said it's like one way to make your life how you want it was like a very simple way to say that, but it's like the one place where you kind of get to control the expectations of your labor if you work within it, and then some you know like get to a place where people want to show it, which involves like a lot of other conditions for it. But, you know, uh, a f friend of mine that who's, yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, who's an artist you love that you think we'd be surprised by? Doesn't have to be a visual artist either. Oh, the, okay, surprised by. I think every artist that I love would not be a surprise to people that have <laughs> seen the work, but... Uh, or who's, I guess, if not surprised by them, who's an artist that you love that you're just, you're in love with right now? Okay. Uh, Judith Scott. Nice. Yeah. Okay, that was it. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I know it usually takes a minute. You've had yeah. questions, they were on your mind. Do you think they're irrelevant now? They're not irrelevant. If you have anything that you want to say or ask, please do. Yeah? Um, I was thinking about how, um, looking at the different ways in the painting work, that there's, there's like nine different ways already just the images we saw. And how do you even begin to think about depicting a body <clears throat> and then you move so fluidly between them all. And then the sculptures, though, which are mostly found objects, you've said, are, are, I guess, are all, actually. But um, actually, also, and I just, I'm, I'm asking this because mm -hmm. I'm wondering if I'm projecting this yeah. or if it's actually in there. And I'm thinking about, like, how do you go about selecting objects and assembling because they seem to be also bodies. And like, yeah. yet another way to think about a body in order to have it to create a place. Yeah. Well, I, I select things that uh, fit, like, jigsaw puzzles or, like, orifices. Like, something has to have enough, like, things to basically play with other things. I, I do select, like, flat things, but they have to have a lot of content. But when I'm looking for things, you know, I've seen, like, Ikea shelves in, like, every city that I've ever been in. But I'm usually not after, like, they have to kind of have a certain, like, structure to hold themselves up from the beginning. Um which you can usually tell, or be something that did have a structure that's like kind of broken enough to like have like a bit of a new structure. But things have to be able to like intermingle and like get stuck. Uh, so I definitely, yeah. And then, you know, it's like for the same reason people, you know, love like distressed jeans. There also has to be kind of like this aesthetic level to <laughs> how tattered a thing is. Um, that, uh, yeah. Yeah. And do you think of those as also another way of depicting yet another when, way? When I gather enough objects in the space, I look at it like a palette. Every installation that I've ever done definitely has like, like, like if you looked at it from above, it would look like an abstract painting. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, thank you for sharing your practice with us. And something I'm really fond about with this is how you use sculpture and objects similar to 
or at least what I'm talking about is like exercise, and especially yeah. when mentioning wrestling, it requires a lot of practice, and it's a martial art, and it's something that kind of, you're always balancing between the tension and precarity of your body, or of someone's body, or something that's, you know, has a weight to it. I was transitioning where I was like, I don't feel comfortable being like in a gym anymore, and I don't want to like go running outside, because I definitely... I'm not like in a you know certain point. So like I learned how to like work out inside, but again, like I was like I well, I was a distance runner in high school. I was on the wrestling team. I did all this stuff, and then I came here in transition and was like, oh, the subways are hard. So there's definitely a point in this practice where I'm like, I'm gonna get a great workout if I just get left alone in a room and nobody watches me, and I turn on some music and I get to be by myself with these objects and like exercise my control on them. So that was in there from the beginning. And it was always something where like, oh, well, I could skip yoga today because I'm going to be installing. Um, and learning, of course, how to do these things did come out of like, you know, having this background in wrestling. And uh, I also did kickboxing at a point. Like I know how to like kind of tangle with things. And it felt like kind of second nature to be able to do things with these large objects, usually completely on my own lately. I guess as my dysphoria has <laughs> reduced, I've been like, oh yeah, you could be in the room. I don't, might not even need music or we could all like be together. But from the start, it was like, I just want to be in here like sweating by myself um, with these things. Uh, so yeah, that's how that's in there for sure. I was like kind of funneling one thing into another. But, you know, it's like the same reason that I'm back in New York. It's like the same reason I'm ready to like kind of, I don't know, be around again in a different way. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's yeah. maybe one more. Um, you seem to be like from thanks for small. You seem to be, you seem to be really concerned with like where things end up, like oh, yeah. circulation of, of objects. You know, even going back to like the box and stuff. So like when you. Um, you know, some, some of the super enemy stuff to put back into the community. You like for uh, but how are, how are you thinking about like, where your objects go after? Oh, well, I, uh, with every gallery or institution, uh, they basically tell me like which actual like dump is going to, like they rent like an actual like kind of container for it to just be done properly. Because again, I find everything on the street. Um, I've never been into like a proper dumping ground. The closest that I've been to like a place that had like a lot of objects ready to get picked up was like a squat in Zurich on like my second show. And at that point, then it was like just asking around like if things were like free to have that were already being collected by other people. Um, but at the end point of any of these installations, they don't get dumped back out onto the street. They get like sent to like either like kind of metal scrapping places or just the dump. But of course that doesn't, you know, solve the issue of like where they actually go after the dump. But at least I guess, I don't know, I'm always just like, oh, well, this was like on the street, I guess. It's like another step closer to, yeah, you know, yeah. You know. But yeah. I want to thank you so much. Thank you. This is really, really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if you have any further questions, you can talk to me or Elvira, who's right behind the camera there. Um, I think Sarah has to jet, unfortunately, but hang out. Please enjoy, have a good time. And I want to thank everybody else, everybody here for coming again. And uh, yeah, hopefully you'll join us again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was so good. Thank you. That was so good.